Hi, everyone. Um, I really hope this works. This has been a time trying to get this to work. Um, so the way that I've set this up, and please let me know in the comments, kind of if you guys can see or what that all looks like. I'm still trying to figure out lighting and all of that. Um, okay, so I think we're live. And this is the first time that Lick um, is sort of making remote observing available from home. Um, hi, Kyle. Up until now, it has been, um, you have to either go to the telescope and sit in the control room there and actually do observations there, or you go to a remote observing room and they have everything set up for you and you just log in and you basically operate the telescope the way that you would if you were at the dome, like actually on site. Um, so I am the first person to test out their capabilities from home on this telescope, which is, I don't know why I decided to stream this live, but we're gonna try it. We're gonna see, it's gonna be, you know, a work in process and we're gonna learn together. So I will try to um, kind of be vocal about what I'm doing as I set up the telescope. I'm following along, um, to somebody who also does supernova, our team sets up the telescope very much like him. So over here, you can see um, the like basically setup guide and I'll be following that along pretty closely for now. And then um, as I'll, I'll try to talk about what I'm doing and then um, calibrations will take, well, setup and calibrations will take probably two to three hours. I'm kind of slow because I'm still learning. And then observations will start around 840-ish. Um, I think sunset's at like 815, so about 30 minutes after that. So keep each other kind of entertained in the comments. Um, I think I'm thinking about this a lot, sort of like you guys are shadowing just my run. So it's not going to be a ton of me actively teaching. I mean, I'm going to try to do my best, but remember, this is also my job and I'm trying to, you know, do that right as well. So um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. So I just got all these GUIs open and my first step is going to be, oh, I got a thing saying this is live. Thank you. Um, okay. So my first step is going to be to like set up the GUIs the way that I typically set them up. So um, I purposely chose to not do screen sharing and instead have it, um, this camera actually look at these screens partially so you guys can see me talking about it, but also partially because, um, it's, I don't know, it can be kind of boring if you're just looking straight at plots and stuff. So, um, hopefully this will be a little bit more entertaining. And finally, some of this stuff is proprietary, not any of the lick stuff, but specifically, um, the targets that we're observing. I, um, I'm going to try to keep those under wraps a little bit. Um, so anyway, not a huge deal, but um, here we go. So GUI is graphical user interface for people asking. Um, so I have two data takers. There's a, oh, see something already disappeared. There's a red side and a blue side. And let's see if I can get this going the right way. So the, typically there's three monitors at the very least where you actually do this stuff. And I only have two plus my laptop, which I guess I should use for this. So let's see, you can see I have so many things open. Um, so this is a spare monitor, come down here. Ah. And then another spare monitor. So the reason we start early to calibrate the telescope is because we're using a specific instrument and that instrument could be different from what other instruments use, uh, what other scientists use as their instrument. So we have to calibrate the instrument in order to be able to take our specific data. And we are using the cast spectrograph, which will be placed on the end of the Shane telescope. So what you're gonna see in my data, you're gonna be able to see what the telescope is pointing at as like a little dot. And then you're gonna be able to see the actual spectrum that the spectrograph picks up 
once we start actually taking data. Um, so right now you can actually see that over here, this is the telescope being pointed at the dome and it's obviously closed right now because there's it's sunlight um, and we don't want to ruin the telescope. We can't look at anything right now. So the telescope is closed, which is why you can't see anything right here. So typically, I don't really know how I'm going to set this up. I think Kyle in the comments said he's observing in like a week or something on this exact telescope. So glad I can be the guinea pig, Kyle. Okay, so maybe we do that. And then I'm still trying to figure out how to connect my my screens. Not very clear. So I'll talk through what all of these windows mean, but for now, just hold tight while I try to just set it up so that I can take data at some point, hopefully. Last night, the observer um, wasn't able, even able to open the dome because of the humidity. So that's definitely something to, we're, we're keeping an eye on. It's sunny where we are. Oh no, there's clouds. I lied. Um, so we'll see if we can actually take data or not. We're, I don't know yet. Um, cool. All right. So that's working. So I'm going to bring my little checklist down with me. So I can figure out how to work these monitors, <laughs> which apparently I cannot. I told you guys this was going to be a learning experience. But yeah, I'm happy to have company while I do this. Okay, so I have all of my, well, most of my things open and running. This is going to be a problem. I don't really know how I'm going to set this up. So you can see I have a ton of things open on both of these. These are virtual desktops. And maybe what I do is this. I have to have all of the GUIs visible when I end up observing. Okay. This is better. That way I can actually see my stuff. Okay, cool. I feel like I'm talking to myself because I'm not actually monitoring the chat. Sorry, guys. Um, okay. So what is next on my checklist? POCO connection, okay. So this is basically asking, you wanna check and see if you are connected to the telescope. And I got that window saying it was okay, so I'm good to go. So then the next thing is, let's see. So now we're gonna do what's called a UVIR setup. So we're, that gives you a sense of the wavelength range that we're going to be observing in. Um, so I have to open an X term window, which is a terminal. Oh wait, no, this is different now. Well, well, we'll see how this goes. LS data pass. That does not work. Great. How do I actually, oh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> oh, this is a learning curve. Okay, open an X term on these virtual windows, which are not 
my windows. This is very confusing. So I'm basically acts, I'm basically mirroring the computers on site onto my laptop and my monitors. So I am still trying to get used to that, I guess. Um, okay. So open an next term window. And we're going to do once I find my mouse. Do LS data cast. Cool. So I'm basically just checking to make sure that the observer in the previous night deleted all or moved all of his data or her data or their, their data to a different directory so that I don't overwrite their data. Um, which is good. They don't have any data in here. So now I can start recalibrating the telescope. So I'm going to go over to this window, which is called the cast motor control. You can kind of see it. It's blue and red. Um, it's this one. And I am going to click this button and do calibrate. Then all stages. So I'm just recalibrating the telescope. So I have a blank slate. And then I can start actually doing things. How's everyone's day? Are you guys having a good time? You guys hanging in there during lockdown? I'm sad we don't get to do drunk science tonight, but Sunday it'll be back. Um, but I, I highly encourage people to enjoy your beverage of choice and hang out with us tonight as we observe. All right, almost done with this. <sighs> Kyle. <laughs> I have group meeting in an hour and haven't read the paper yet. Yes, that uh, sounds like my life. Okay, so now I'm going to go and load a group setup, um, which basically means I am using the same setup as somebody else who looks at host galaxies of supernova. So I can just go in and go to load setup file. And then I'm going to go to the directory where this is. And then I'm going to apply it all. So now I'm moving the telescope, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I'm moving the telescope. No. Mm -mm. I'm doing something to the telescope to make it so that it looks, it has the same setup as somebody else's. I don't know if I'm actually moving the telescope yet. I'm moving parts in the telescope. That's, that's, that's the right way to say that. Okay. So now I'm just going to double check that everything is where it should be. Spec to zero. And I'll go through what these things are shortly. Again, I'm looking at this window to make sure that the telescope is you know doing what i wanted to cool everything looks good now i'm going to open up my log so i sat in on the last night's observer's setup um just to he's he's also a berkeley affiliate um and i just wanted to see where what his setup was last night to make sure that i'm going to be on the right track for my setup today Okay. Oh, my dog's toys were delivered. I'm really excited. Yeah, no, it takes me hours to set this thing up. So guys, really do whatever you want right now. If you want to join, that's great. But also there's no pressure. The exciting stuff, I think, 
Well, I don't know. I think calibrating a telescope is exciting. I'm literally com calibrating a 120 inch telescope. So that's, I mean, 120 inches is the aperture, but that's pretty neat. Okay. So now I'm going to set up the blue side data taker right here. I'm going to change these numbers to be what the person observing last night had and they are already there, which is good. I'm going to make sure the shutter is open. Bidding row one. So the shutter is, you know, are you collecting light or not? Think of a shutter on a camera. So whether that's open, you're collecting light. If it's closed, you're not. So my shutter, I want it to be open right now. The read speed slow. And image recording on record. And then I'm going to do the same thing to, that was the blue side. I'm going to do the same thing to the red side. So open, slow, observation number. I'm not gonna change yet, change this to record. Cool. Okay. So now I'm gonna start to turn on some lamps. Ugh. This is why setting this up is important. Um, so we have lamps that are on site and we calibrate our observations by heating up elements in these lamps and taking spectra of them. So I have argon, neon, helium, cadmium, mercury, all of these different elements. And I am going to start to heat these up so that I can then take uh, take spectra of them. Except I didn't select which ones I should be. So give me one second and make sure that I have the right elements selected. So the left block is going to be spare argon, helium, and mercury cadmium. And then the right block is going to be helium, mercury, and neon. And so these are basically elements that show up in the blue and red side of the spectrum. So I'm going to calibrate each side separately um, based on the elements that peak in those regions of wavelength. Um, is there a reason to not use the AO system? We don't need it for our targets. Also, I don't know if Lick has an AO system. Maybe it does. I don't know. Um, is this going to be recorded slash saved? Yes, I, I think. If I do it right, yes. <laughs> um, okay. So now I'm going to turn on this block. Turn selected lamps on. And for both the blue and the red side data takers, put the observation number at 500. I don't know why we do that, but that's what we're supposed to do. Oh no, I do not want the exposure to be 500 seconds. 
exposure is 10 seconds. Observation number is 500. And then call us UV centering. centering so oh that's neat I didn't realize that they had an AO system that's cool haha <laughs> they were the pioneers cool I learned something new every day um okay so I'm centering the telescope right now and to do that I changed the observation number which I'm going to record in my logbook. My logbook is not well done, but that's fine. I'm getting better every day. Um, so this is the UVIR setup. So my observation number for both blue and red is 500. And I switch the slit. The slit is how much light gets in. So I'm going to switch it to be very narrow, to be 0.5 arc seconds. Switch the mirror to mirror position two. Oh boy. Okay. The mirror is already at mirror position two. Great. and take an exposure. So you're going to see your first exposure. I'm going to put this over here so that I can do it quickly on both. So you have to take both the red and the blue side separately. Oh, this is going to be annoying. I'm going to have to reorganize this. Okay. And we're going to start. You heard that sound? means I'm doing things. Um, my PhD project is on supernova. Um, I'm trying to understand the physics of progenitors, stars, progenitors of supernova. Oh god, that's loud. Um, I am also trying to find Betelgeuse-like stars in M33. Um, yeah, all things core collapse supernova. Okay, so this is this is what this looks like. This looks like shit. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me make sure that I have these set up the right way. So I kind of skipped over that. Okay, and Second level tag for the blue and the red side data takers should be All right, I'm going to change something. Geyer control window, change this to two. show label. Told you guys I was still learning. <laughs> Sorry. 
Um, okay, cool. Show label. Great. Zoom level to be one on the blue side and to be a half on the red side. Oh, that looks, that's better. Okay. Um, okay. And then on the second level of this, I actually have to change this. So I have to change the observer's name to be my name. The observer tonight. Same thing over here. So I'm going to retake that exposure. For just why not? Let's take another exposure. Okay. I'm actually going to right over the ones that we just took. Yeah, okay. Ready? That sound is great. It keeps us awake at night. <laughs> um. Okay, great. So seems to be pretty centered, I think. We can change the, yeah. So we're basically trying to make sure that it's equal right here. And the white is equal on both the top and the bottom. Um, same thing over here. We're trying to make sure that these two sides are equal. They're more or less equal. Um, so I'm just gonna go with that. Okay, so now let's look at the wavelength range. Oh, my boyfriend's back. Hello. Live? I am live. Cool. <laughs> hi. He says hi, everyone. Hi. Okay. Huh? Oh, are you trying to hear? No, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the live. I could, my headphones died. But they're charging. It's okay. Comments twice are here. They're downstairs. Mm -hmm, I think so. I don't know. How many people are here? Everyone says hi. Hello. Let Taylor calibrate. Oh, I thought you meant. I thought you said celebrate, Kyle, and I was like, celebrate, celebrate me calibrating. Kyle, one, two, three. Huh? Kyle, one, two, three. Zero. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, All right, I'll be in and out. Okay, cool. Okay, so now let's calibrate the wavelengths. 62 people, or 52, no, 62. Wow, that's amazing. Cool, thanks, guys. All right, Um. okay, what'd you get? What is that? Weights? <gasps> yes, I've been using gallon water jugs as weights and we just got our our actual weights in the mail and we're really excited about it okay back to wavelength calibrations all right so we are going to load a python program called python 
well, it's called get WL range, get wavelength range. I know it's really, really interesting. Python get WL range dot pi. They completely changed, oh, Kyle, you'll want to know this. They completely changed the directory architecture when moving to remote observation, and I don't know why. Um, so very glad that I shadowed Tom yesterday because he was trying to look for this file and couldn't find it. And if that were me, I would have freaked out. Um, is calibration all done in software or does the operator have to tweak anything? Both. Yeah, I know it sucks. Um, both. So I will talk about that in a second. A lot of the things, most things are through software, though for one thing, they actually have to manually shift something on the telescope. Okay. So I am on this wavelength range. And now I'm going to type my most recent observation. Aha! This is this is cool. Okay, so this shows the spectrum that is the master spectrum. So that's like if everything were working right, our spectrum should look exactly like the ma the master spectrum. Um, this is our test spectrum, the one that we just took. And as you can see, I hope you can see vaguely, they look very, very, very similar. So I have to, oh shit, I messed up. I have to click the peaks that are similar. It's really fun. It's like a, it's like a game you play as a little kid. That's it. I, I did it. Yeah, it work. Well, this is supposed to be really fun and easy, but for some reason it's not working. So let me try to debug this. Okay, yes, great. Congratulations, the instrument does not need to be adjusted. The blue side wavelength range, so this is the wavelength range that we're gonna get on the blue side, is between 36, 17 angstroms and 57, 30 angstroms. I'm gonna write that down. So I need to make sure that my advisor is not slacking me. Nope. Okay, cool. So this will help when I do my data reduction to make sure that I'm in the right range. It is, here I'll write it, 3617 angstroms to 5730 angstroms. Um, cool. So if a shift is needed, um, <laughs> if a shift is needed, I would have to actually get the on-site telescope operator to figure something out and potentially move the, move a, a part of the telescope. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to do the same thing on the red side. So I'm going to go to the same directory. This is a really neat program. I'm really happy that someone wrote it. So as you can see, Again, they're pretty similar. You can see these big lines at least. So great. Congratulations, the instrument does not need to be adjusted. Yay! So our red wavelength range goes from 53, 54 angstroms 
to 10,717 angstroms. So this is good because that means we have some overlap in the blue and the red, which we want. Um, okay, great. So, Now we are done with that, which is awesome. So now we're on to focusing the telescope. Okay. So I'm gonna change the cast motor control, this window again, and I'm going to do, oh wait, I lied. I'm gonna go up here. No, did I lie? Nope, I, I didn't lie. I am going. Come back over here, over here. I'm gonna do changes to be half a half arc second slit, mirror position two, Decker is one arc second long, collimator values from the previous run. And I'm gonna do 10 seconds, 10 seconds, left block is on, perfect. Change the names to be focusing. I really hope that this is at least a little bit interesting to you guys. I know that it's a lot at one time and it's hard to see exactly what I'm doing, but hopefully this will give you just some vague idea of what calibrating a telescope looks like. So first we're set everything up. Then we try to look at um, making sure that our wavelengths, our wavelengths are covering the right range. Now we're going to focus the telescope and then we're going to keep, um, we're going to do some other things after that. Okay. So, now I am going to take an exposure on both sides. I love that sound. Okay, then I'm going to record my values. Oh my God, that is so loud. Okay, good, this is good. So you can see, actually you probably cannot see, but there's this really pink screen here. Uh, that looks strange. I don't know why that looks weird, but this is a pink screen with little dots. You guys probably cannot see the dots, but the dots are um, peaks in wavelength. So, we're gonna use uh, a specific program to try to figure out if we're getting the right wavelength solutions for these dots and keep an eye out for cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are annoying and bad. Rebecca, if you could explain cosmic rays in the comments, that'd be awesome because I, I will not give a good explanation, but they fuck up your data basically. Okay, sorry if there's any children watching. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna write down the collimator values for the observations that I just took. So on the blue side, my collimator was 23.058 and on the red, it was negative 0 0.450. Now I'm gonna decrease the collimator values. And then I'm gonna write those down and take another exposure. All of this is to calibrate. So that's why we do this. So now I'm gonna take another exposure. <laughs> Devin, that was funny.
Man, it is so nice to do this from home. This is great. Although it is going to take a lot of willpower to not go to bed, but still, this is great. Okay, readout complete. Now I'm going to decrease the collimators again. And record. And take another exposure. Oh, that actually looks way better. I wonder why the first one looked weird. That's strange. Hello. Hey. It's UCLA. Yeah. Yeah. Irvine. Yeah. Funny. I'm fine. Yeah, you're funny. Can Same I have sure. a cookie? Yeah, what you working on? I'm doing the wavelength calibrations. You would actually really enjoy watching this. I'll, I'll log in for your next live stream. <laughs> <laughs> My boyfriend is giving me a hard time. Always. Your dog? Oh, did he get his toys? Oh, no. Oh. He, looks like he looks ready to get his toys. These are disgusting. Yeah. These are All right, I'm going to stop talking to you now because I have my, my people to talk to. Oh, but can I have a cookie? <laughs> Thanks. Okay. All right, so now we go increase the collimator values. I know this is a really fun step by three above the initial value. So the initial value is 23. So now I'm gonna increase that. Three, increase that, take another exposure, just two more of these, and then we will actually look for cosmic rays, which is really cool. I have a headache. I think it's stress. All right, start exposure, start exposure. Can you hear a comment in the background? <laughs> He's whining because we're not paying attention to him. Yes, Keck is wild to observe that my advisor um was also really affected by the altitude one time and like was out for a walk got lost or something and passed out <laughs> not good altitude there is wild i've never been though i'm sad okay great and then we do this one more time and then we get to like for cosmic rays that was oh i need to record that 26.062 and 2.550. 29.063 and 5.550. Okay. And last one. I'm really glad that my Wi-Fi is able to take this. This is good. Yeah, I know. Did you read it? No. Oh, I, it go. I know. That doesn't mean anything though. I know, but they're not. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm on your side when I heard that. Yeah. Can I have a cookie? He's doing it on purpose. Yeah, I know. Kyle, we're about to...
look for cosmic rays. Thank you. I made these cookies last night. I got you the best one too. Thank you. Okay. Great, we're done. Now, let's look for some cosmic rays. So, exit this program. We're going to open IDL. This is the only time I will ever use IDL. It's called the viewers of IDL, is it? That's why Rebecca's in the comments to tell them. Mm -hmm. That's why Rebecca is in the comments to tell them. Oh, what well, can you tell me? It's a program. It's a language. Oh, it's a language. Okay. It's the grandfather of Python. Really? <laughs> that's what Kyle just said. I was going to say who said that because that's funny. <laughs> we are using IDL here because this is an archaic, um, I don't know, an archaic program that we're about to run to look for cosmic rays that's been handed down from observer to observer over the years. So first we're going to focus the red side. And I'm going to enter <clears throat> the first red side file name which is r501.bits. Aha. So, I don't know if you guys can see, these are all of the dots that are on uh, this window. And this is like a zoomed in version of that dot. And it's gonna look weird if there is a cosmic ray. So I'm gonna say this one, is, so I basically get to tell the computer which one I wanna accept and which one I wanna reject. So I'll accept this one. I will reject that one because that looks weird to me. There's two, it's like a, I don't know, it looks bad. I'll accept that one, accept that one. And I'm basically just moving down the line of dots here. Accept, accept, accept. Accept. I don't like that one. Reject. Accept. Accept. Okay. Reject. Reject. Accept. I guess I'll accept that. I'm not accepting that. Accept. That looks weird, but okay. This is a cosmic ray. And you want to know why I know that? Because so this is our normal line of dots. Damn, you really can't see. Well, here we go. Normal line of dots, cosmic ray. So the cosmic ray is offset from the normal line of dots. We don't want cosmic rays. Oh, I need to plug this computer in. My bad. Reject. It fell in comments. Dog bowl. Sorry. Reject. Accept. Definitely reject that. Reject. I don't even know where these things are coming from. Okay. Now I will enter the next bits file. Okay, so now I look at the wavelength solution and see if I like it. So for the red side, I look at the X full width half max. That looks like poop. I don't like this. Hmm. Let's 
do two more. Ah. There we go, that's better. So we're looking at, yes, Kyle, I needed to map out more points. I was an idiot. Um, so we're looking at this white curve and we're looking to see where this is at a minimum. And it seems to be that the collimator position for it to be at a minimum is negative 0 0.3766. So red side, collimator, negative 0 0.3766. Cool. So now we're going to go to the blue side. never know how to actually close these ideal windows. Okay. So now I am going to do the same thing for the blue side. So cast focus P blue. Yes. R501 that fits. Oh, nope. Blue. B501 that fits. And now I'm going to start to accept or reject. So accept, 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 accept. So the red side, for whatever reason, is far more easily subject to cosmic ray interference than the blue side. So I shouldn't have as many cosmic rays on the blue side. And it seems to be true. Most of these looked good. 503 dot fits. Yes. B 504 dot fits. Yes. B 505 dot fits. Okay, cool. Now we look for the green curve. And we see that the Y full width half max is at 23.309. So if you remember, we started, we started the blue side at 23.058 and now we're moving it to 23.3099. So it's very close. And then the red side, we started at negative 0 0.450 and now we're moving it to negative 0.3766. So very, very similar to what we started with. I'm going to close these and I'm going to type those new collimator values in here. Oops. So the blue was 23.3099 and the red was negative 0 0.3766. Okay. Cool. Now I'm going to switch this decker back to spec and switch the slit back to two. And I'm going to go ahead and save this as a new setup so that people can access it if they want to. Cool. 
saved. So now we can actually start to take some observations that we are going to use to calibrate our data when we have to reduce our data later on. So we're going to take some arcs and some flats. So one of the astronomers in the chat, if you guys could explain what an arc and a flat is, that'd be cool. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and get this set up to do that. So load the UVIR setup, which I just did. Turn on the left block while it's already on. And now I'm going to switch the slit to a narrow slit. I'm going to change the exposure times that I have set to be appropriate for arcs. So this is now going to be thirty-five. The red side will be fifty-five. I don't really know why we do different lengths of exposures on the blue and the red, but we do. And then I'm going to change the name and the observation number. So I'm going to change both of these to start at one. And the name is going to be UV 0 0.5. I'm going to record this in my log. that I'm going to take an exposure. Oh, it's not good that I'm already yawning. Yes, Kyle, I think you're right about the cosmic rays. Um, everything on the red side is f more finicky due to the cosmic rays. Yes. Yawns are contagious. Sorry. <laughs> Do not yawn. Can you get Comet's toys? Instead of yawning in the background, go get his toys and be useful. <laughs> I'm working too. Good job. Yeah, I, uh, I blast music when I observe. So there will be music later on. Oh man. Okay. Blue side arcs are done. And the red side is printing out right now. So let's check the blue side. So we're gonna do a row cut on the blue and see. So I basically clicked on a line on the blue side on my spectrum and I'm now checking to see if it's oversaturated or if we actually need to lengthen the exposure in order to get a new arc. Um, okay, so we want no lines on the blue side to be above 45,000 and this is just at about 45,000. So that looks good to me. So let's dismiss this window and check the red side. Why does this look so weird? Huh. 
don't really know why this looks so strange. Kyle, I put 55 seconds on the red, which should be enough. The row or the column count seems fine, but the spectrum was strange. I don't think that's, I don't know. Maybe I'll take another one, but that's strange. Uh, let's take one more on the red. So, This was 35 seconds on blue and 55 seconds on red. So we'll do one more on the red side, which puts, I think it's, I think it's this monitor. I don't think it's, yeah, I don't know. All right, let's take one more. I, if I don't take a log, I'll be very sad later. And I don't, I don't want to be sad. Um, yes, I've, I kind of flip between doing it on a notebook and on Google Sheets. When I actually take my observations, I'll do it online on Google Sheets. But for calibrating, I like to do it in a notebook. Yeah, why does this look so weird? That's strange. Huh. Well, I am going to take a picture of this and send it to the observer from last night and see what he thinks because I don't know what I'm doing. Is the mirror in position two? Yes, the mirror is in position two. Oh my God, no problem. I have not moved the mirror. All right, well, we can go ahead and take the right block exposures while we wait. and turn these lamps on. And now I'm just going to take an exposure on the red side. for five seconds to calibrate to get arcs for these elements, which only show up on the red. So let's try that. So this is only for five seconds, so it's way faster. Hopefully I will get a response about this weird thing. See, 
Now that, that's so weird. Why does it look like that? Huh. The counts look good. So I don't know if it's the way that this is reading out or what. I'm going to take a screenshot and send this to someone. I wonder if I can screenshot on here. Um, cool. So after this, we'll take flats if the mirror cover is open and the lights are off in the dome. If not, we'll have to talk to a telescope operator and ask them to do it. And we'll take biases and then we are done calibrating for the afternoon and we will be back on for observing tonight, hopefully, weather permitting. Um, so I'm just going to wait to hear back. If you guys have any questions, I can try to uh, respond right now as we wait. I have to stop yawning. Oh, man. Let's see. How many people are on right now? Wow, this is awesome. Thanks for joining you guys. This is so fun. What a neat experience to do this with people. Why supernova? Because they're awesome. <laughs> they're explosions in space. Why not supernova? Um, and, you know, they, Yes. Wow. Taylor literally just finished my sentence in the background, which is really annoying, but they tell so much about the universe and you can use them as tools to understand various aspects of the universe, like the rate of the expansion and, you know, stuff about the circumstellar medium and interstellar medium and distribution of elements throughout our universe. And they, why are you whispering in the background? Um, so yeah, supernova are awesome. What is the coolest part about observing your own data? Well, from a kind of lame answer, I think it's really helpful to know what goes into observing. So when you're reducing your data, you know what you're looking at. It's really hard to reduce data and not know what the observer did. Um, but I get to like, I mean, to be able to actually point a telescope at something, get data, and then analyze that data and learn something about the universe is really amazing, I think. Um, what is the core observation you're trying to make by examining these supernova? We are trying to understand the redshift of these host galaxies of supernova. And by determining the redshift, then we can learn about the rate of the expansion of the universe. Um, is light pollution a factor at the scope? Not, I mean, yes, but it's not, I mean, it's, it's built above everything else. So it's at high elevation so that we don't get too much light pollution. It's really, really beautiful there. If you look up Mount Hamilton, um, you can see 
uh, various parts of, of the telescopes and you can see what the, what the scope is, is actually looking at, which is cool. Bye, Kyle. Um, well, we're still waiting on these folks to help us out on the arcs. Taylor, did you get his toys? Get his toys. He, he has a puzzle coming. And I want him. Oh, look at him. He knows. Yeah. Yes, I did have to submit a proposal to get this time. So Lick is not super, I mean, it's competitive, but it's not, it's not Keck. Um, all right, I just got an email. All right, I am going to Zoom this person. So I'm going to stop video for a minute, um, just have a break, and I will be back once we debug this. I will be right back.
okay, hi, I'm back. Um, turns out that they look fine. So I just don't know how to color map and understand what different colors look like. Um, okay, so we're gonna take dome flats, biases, and then we'll be done. So let's go ahead and um, quickly try to do those. And then we will take a break, unless you guys want to watch Comet get his toys, which you should, because it's a really good time. Um, OK, dome flats. So let's make sure I have that going correctly. Let's switch to the two arc second slit. So for this, the mirror cover has to be open and all the dome lights must be off, which I just got confirmation from Ellie that they are. So that's great. And mirror in position four, which is what Kyle was talking about earlier. This is really the only time that we change the mirror position, I think. Okay, I will definitely show you guys comments toys. I'm really excited about them. Okay. Um, okay, the mirror looks to be in position four. So now we're going to go to the slime lamp. These names are killing me. Um, wait, let me make sure. Should I turn off? Yes. <laughs> Come back. Turn off off the lamps. Now go to this gooey. Yeah. Oh my god, this is gonna kill me. No, don't open iMessage. Huh. This, I'm trying to maneuver these screens. It's like very not easy. Okay, go to this gooey. Change the sup blue dimmer to something. I forgot where that is. To a value of 25. Here we go. On 25. Great. Oh, and I just got confirmation from Ellie, who is a support astronomer on site that this is the first time this telescope has been used in, or will be used in two months, basically since they shut down. So there's gonna be a learning curve, not just for me, but for the telescope operator who's on site, who's actually telling the telescope where to go, um, manually doing that by doing it on his laptop or computer. Um, so Ellie's gonna be joining us later um, I think everybody's really excited to actually get on sky tonight, hopefully, and get some data for the first time in a couple months, which is really cool. Um, okay. I just got some notification, but I don't know what it was, so I'm going to ignore it. Okay. Uh, exposure time on the blue side is going to be 45 seconds. And exposure time, oh my god, this is going to drive me nuts. Exposure time on the red side is going to be one second. Observation number two. I gotta write this down in my logbook. And the red side is four because we took some tests. Okay, now I'll change the names to be IR to arc second flat and B to arc second flat. And now we're going to take an exposure and see what happens.
There is no drunk science tonight because I absolutely cannot be drunk doing this. <laughs> um, yeah, like this looks bizarre. I'm gonna send an image of this again. I think there might be something wrong with this red side. This looks really weird to me. Blue side looks great. This is what we should want. It's this beautiful spectrum. The red side looks blobby. I don't know why. Um, so let me email Ellie one more time. You know what? I wonder if I move this. What the? No, that still looks weird. I wondered if it was an external monitor thing. Okay. I'm asking Tom because he just responded. So we are, I'm going to run this by then before the next step is to take a bunch of flats and um, I want to make sure that this is right before I do that. Uh, yes. So I'm sure you want to see the screens. I, yeah, no, this is, uh, this was a, a discussion uh, with Rebecca and I have like, like I said earlier, um, our targets, I can't share them. So I don't want to get too detailed on the screen once we observe. Um, none of this software is proprietary, but in terms of just debugging things and Using up my internet bandwidth, I figured out, or I figured that it would be easier to just zoom you guys. You all are on a separate machine right now than this stuff going on. So I'm sorry that I can't be more, can't show more, but hopefully it's enough. Okay, did Ellie respond? This looks so strange to me. This arc sorry flat this flat is beautiful my red side looks bad this is basically as much a peek behind the curtain as i think any one has gotten before um yeah this i mean i wasn't even allowed to really sit in on observing runs until i got permission from some i don't know higher ups when I was an undergrad. Um, 
So I hope that this is enjoyable for you guys. Um, so I guess I can go ahead and start the blue side because the blue side's fine. Let's do a blue side row cut just to be sure. Yep, they look great. The red side column cut. Seems fine. I don't really know why it's rendering so weirdly, but it certainly looks fine. So. Taylor just dropped something. Um, okay. It's okay. So we're going to go ahead and start on the blue side. So it's manually taking images uh, or taking flats on the blue side. I'm going to wait to get feedback on the red side before I push the, the go button. But while we wait, we can give Comet his toys. <laughs> This is the nerdiest thing. I love it. Okay, Comet. So this is, what is this? I forgot. Oh my God. He looks really funny right now. I, I wish I could show him to you guys. I don't, I don't even remember which computer I'm streaming this on. Is it this one? Yeah, there he is. There he is. Come here, bud. Come here. Good boy. Sit. Sit, bud. Yeah. Sit. <laughs> he doesn't like the sound. <laughs> Can I have some scissors? Oh, we got our, our box. Good. Thanks. Oh, man. All right. I'm just going to turn the screen so you guys can see him because he looks Can really I cute. Nice. All right, come. Sit. Good boy. <laughs> you can see your dishwasher. Uh-uh, buddy. <laughs> oh, God, this is going to be excruciating to listen to. <laughs> you wish, bud. You ready? You ready? Good boy. All right. Get ready for some squeaking. I'll try to keep it on the DL. Um, yeah, yeah, can you take it away from him if it gets if he like really starts squeaking really loudly? You just let me know. If the squeaking gets annoying, please tell me, and we'll take the to the toy away from him. It is annoying for me, so do not be afraid to tell me. Um, yeah, nobody's responding to me. The blue side's going. Oh God, yes, Rebecca, the squeaking will keep me awake, I guess, in my nightmares. Are people still watching this? Wow, I am shocked that people are watching this. I'm so happy. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Just got a text. How's the column cut on the flat look? Great. What is this column cut? Let's see. Does he tear up his toys? Yes, immediately. We bought him a toy and he, we gave it to him yesterday. It's supposed to be indestructible. He tore it up in 10 minutes. So this is gonna be gone very shortly. It's really annoying. Every squeak is another sign that Comet's happy. It's true. <laughs> okay, 
So if we get the go ahead shortly, then we'll go ahead and finish the flats on the red side. And then once those are done, we'll take biases and then we'll pause for now. I'm gonna eat some dinner, maybe take a nap and get ready to observe tonight. I have energy shots. I do not condone energy drinks. However, oh God. Um, however, I have to drink them when I observe. They're the only time that I drink energy drinks. They're so bad for me, but I will fall asleep and that's not good when you are operating a telescope. I heard a story one time. I the, There's a fun time when you are operating a telescope when like you get into a groove and you like finally start collecting data and you're like going, you're going and anyway you end up just talking to the telescope operator and apparently like some of the older uh scientists who go to observe fall asleep as they observe i mean i guess everybody probably falls asleep at some point but there's there's one person who just keeps falling asleep and they have to like manually wake them up it's really funny um okay great thomas says that it looks good so I guess it's just a weird rendering issue. It really should look like this. This looks strange, um, but we think it's good. So we're gonna go ahead and move forward once I get the green light from him. Yes, we are gonna start in about five and a half hours. Sunset is at 8.15. So I'll be logging back on around eight and I'm gonna probably start the live stream around, I don't know, 8.30 maybe. Uh, we're going to get some standard stars, which I'll talk about um, during that stream, and then we'll start looking at galaxies. All right. I also got Comet a, a puzzle, but who knows if he's... I think he's brilliant, but sometimes he's not so brilliant. So we'll see how he does with the puzzle. All right, I'm gonna try closing this window and seeing. So much happy in the background. <laughs> it's true. He really loves squeakers. Oh, Colin, I'm sorry, but we will have um yeah, the stream will be will be saved to my YouTube. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see if, if the weather works out. I hope it does. Comet, come here. Comet, come. It's being a little poop face. Come, give me, give me your toy. Where's your toy? Go get it. Oh, buddy, you guys gotta see this. <laughs> come here, shake. Good boy. I love him. Um. I'm sorry guys, this is not very exciting. Once we figure this out, then we'll be good to go. Just waiting on the confirmation. Does anyone have any fun plans tonight other than this, obviously?
All right, so I just closed that window. We're gonna try to reopen it and see if the image renders better. But I don't know how to reopen it, so I'm waiting to hear back. Oh, maybe it's this. Yeah, it's definitely this. Okay, I'm just going to confirm that everything is the same as when I closed it. Waiting for that to load. Okay, Ellie just uh, signed on as well to see what it looks like. So she, you can see her mouse moving. Maybe you can't, there you go. Um, she's messing around to see what, what it looks like. So I'm gonna meet this one more time and sign on to a Zoom with her and then I'll be back. We'll finish this. Um, with the flats and the biases. Um, so we'll be back in a minute. Okay, so it seems like because we're using this VNC viewer on a Mac, so remotely, um, it is reverting to using fewer colors because my bandwidth is slow or something. So regardless, the science is fine. So I'm gonna keep going and then we should be good to take biases and then we'll be done. So, let me make sure I'm doing this right.
Okay. Um, so, hi, Anne. Um, we are using the Lick Observatory uh, Shane telescope, which is a 120 inch telescope. That sign or that sound just tells me that the blue side is done. The red side is going through right now. What I'll probably do is just um, take the biases on my own because this is going to last for a little bit longer. So if you guys have any last minute questions, please type them in the chat and I'll get to them now. And then we'll log back on around 830 to do our observations. Um, so let's see, am I missing any other questions? Doesn't seem like it. Um, yeah, so my last step is going to be taking biases, which is basically just making sure that I'm recording any sort of biases that the instrument already has, so I can then subtract them uh, from my data when I do my data reductions. Um, yeah, thank you, Rebecca, for posting the live webcam from the mountain. If you guys want to check the weather alongside me, I'll be checking the weather for the next few hours to see how it goes. Uh, hopefully, the humidity doesn't get too high. Um, we're going to look out for things that are bad for observing are high humidity um, and dew. So we want to avoid that. So I will be back online around 830 to take our first observations of standard stars, and then we'll move on to galaxies. Um, cool. I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you so much for joining me. I will see you guys in about five hours or so. All right. Bye.